Sechaz Bava Kama Daf Kuf Gimel contains one Mishnah. The first part of the Daf until the Mishnah is the Gemara offering another explanation for a Brisa that discuss what happens if you buy something in someone else's name, how can you get it put into your name? Then we get to our Mishnah, which discusses returning a stolen object, how far do you have to go to return it, and under what circumstances. Let's begin. The Gemara's already brought out the last Daf of Brisa, which says two cases of somebody who buys a field in someone else's name. And the Gemara trying to explain the cryptic words of the Brisa. So first it says, if you buy something in someone else's name, then you cannot force him to sell it. Mm. Then it says that if you buy something in his name and you make it tonight, then you can force him to sell it. So what's it referring to? The Gemara is given one shot. The Gemara brings the second shot from Abaye. Abaye says, we're talking about someone who buys a field in the name of his friend. Machogis Hashanim of the Gears here is that the friend is the Reish Galuso, who's a powerful person, that he needed to invoke his name to get the seller to sell. But he... Has it's sold in someone else's name, and as the Gemara will show, he added that person's name or he put it in that person's name in order to convince the seller to sell. And now he wants the seller to write another star for him. So the seller wrote the original star for this Rish Galusa, whoever it is, the other person, and now the buyer wants him to give him another star for him. That way he can have it in his own name. So the person whose name he put it in wants to take it away from him, or if his Yerushim want to take it away from him, he won't lose it to him. So the question is, can he force him to write that or not? So in the ordinary case where there was no Tanai, he cannot force him to write another star. But if he made a Tanai at the time of the purchase, that he's making a Tanai, that you have to give me such a star, then he's allowed to, then he can force him, and the seller has to write him a star for him. Now, yeah, the Gemara has questions of Pshita on each one. The Gemara says, first of all, the first Allah that you can't force him to write another Shafi Pshita. Why should you be able to force him? He sold it the way you said it, as being sold in the other person's name. So the Gemara says, no, because you may have thought that he could argue that you should have known that I really wanted it for myself because no one buys, no one gives money for something that they're not going to get and have it put in someone else's name. You sh- should have understood that it was doing it just to add strength to my position, to my case, and then I really wanted to buy it for myself. And then I'm going to want you to write another star for me, and I was actually buying it for myself. Kamash Malan, that the seller can say, no, either I sold it to the person whose name you put it in, or I assume you did, with the understanding that he was going to give you another star. I know you wanted another star from me, and therefore you shouldn't demand one from me now. Now, the second case where he made it tonight, so of course if he made it tonight, that's what he has to do. Of course he has to do it. So when he says in the Chiddush, we're actually referring to a case where he didn't make an explicit tonight with the seller. He made it tonight with the witnesses who were recording this whole thing. And he said to them, I need another star for myself. But he said it in front of the seller. So and then he turns to the seller and says, so I said I want I, I, I said I need another star. And the seller could say, I thought you meant you needed another star from the person whose name you put it in. And then he says, no, that's why I said in front of you. I said in front of you, so you should understand that I need another star from you. Okay, now the Gemara brings a case that happened, and this gets us, it's a similar to our halacha. It, it, he gets into a shayla of ribas and refers back to halacha. We had said it earlier, the name of the Bnei Marava, that if Reuben makes a shliach, uh, for he, if Reuben makes Shimon a shliach to buy things from him, the seller is not machinated to Reuven. The seller is machinated to Shimon. So the case here, the Gemara says, Rav Kahana wanted to buy cotton, and he put down money for it. Now the Gemara understands he gave money for it, and he also did a Kenyan on it. And um, he didn't take it home yet, but he was coining it. And then the price of cotton went up. And the people who were selling it to him decided that they don't want to sell it at the price that they accepted before. They want to sell it at a higher um, price. Therefore, they took the cotton, they sold it to someone else. They got money to give back to Rav Kahana, to give him back the money that he had spent on it. And Rav Kahana went to Rav and he said, can I get more money? Or can, do I have to take the money that I gave? So Rav said to him, if at the time that you bought it, at the time that you gave the money, they said, this is Rav Kahana's, this is uh, Kahana's cotton, so then it's yours already, it belongs to you, and when it increased in the value, it increased in your property, and you can take the higher amount. If however, they didn't say that, so then they just owed you the lower amount, and now you want them to owe you a higher amount, because it's later, that would be at least Merci Caribis, and you wouldn't be allowed to do that. So says the Gemara, this is like those Bnei Marav who say that the sellers were not machnet to the original purchaser. Here also the sellers were not machnet to Rav Kahana at the time that he gave the 
money. So Maris, what does that have to do with this? If Ghana here, he didn't give four zoos, and now he wants back eight zoos. He wasn't planning on taking the cotton back, on, on t taking his money back in return. So that was happening. He gave the money for the cotton. He wants to take the cotton. The cotton belongs to him. It went up. He owns it. Why well, should it make a difference if they're makna, they're not makna, he bought it, he did a mashikha, went up and has a shush. The fact that these people are holding on to it and they sold it, they it's they stole it from him. That's stolen property, and they should return it. Kishasukzela. They should return it at the value as he paid for it. So what's happening over here? So the answer is that the case is where he didn't do a mashikha. He gave them the money on trust. He trusted that they were going to deliver the cotton. They didn't even actually have the cotton. They took his money to go and buy the cotton. As we've seen a halacha in Hilchas Ribis, that you're allowed to do that. But Rav Zashitase, Rav holds, if you give somebody money at the cheaper price to buy material, to buy merchandise to be delivered later, and you're fixing that you're going to pay the cheaper price, even if the price later goes up, you're going to get it at the lower price, which is why you're giving the money now. So later, when the value is higher, if you're going to get merchandise, you can do that. Because you paid for the merchandise now, you got the merchandise now, even though the price that you're, even though you're receiving a better deal because you paid in advance, it's not rib, it's because you bought it at that time. Even though you didn't have it, it didn't make a Kenyan in. However, to have them give you the money later, instead of giving you the merchandise saying to deliver the money, that looks like straight up ribbis because you gave, let's say, four zoos, and then the price went up and they give you money back and they give you more, that is you're giving a lower amount, you're getting back a higher amount, that's real ribbis. And that's why Rob says, if that would be the situation, it would not allow them to give the money back. But have to return the actual cotton itself or return the lower amount that you had given in the first place. This concludes the Gemara, now we get to our next Mishnah. The Mishnah speaks about how you turn something that you have stolen, and the bishop will divide it up into the carrot, that is the thing you stole itself, as well as the extra fifth that you have to add. So somebody stole $100, and now he's returning it, so uh, he has to add a fifth. Specifically, if he swore falsely, he has to add a fifth, and a fifth, of course, is $25. That way, it's 25 is a fifth of the total 125 that he's returning. And therefore, the karen is called $100, and the extra 25 is called chemish. Now, the rule is that he has to return it, he has to follow the victim of the theft all the way to Madai, meaning he has to go to whatever lengths are required to make sure that he gets it back in his hand, and not give it to the guy's son, or to a messenger, or to someone else to bring it to him. He has to give it to him himself. The only exceptions are if it's so hard for the guy to get there and there's a sheikh of the basin that's traveling, Chazam is special to Kanas the to make it easy for people to return things that you could give it to a sheikh basin that you could trust. Or if the victim himself had died, he's not around anymore, then he'd give it to his son who takes his place or his inheritor, whoever he, it might be. Now, the Gemara is going to say this rule of having to return it properly is only if you have at least a shavar pruta remaining of the karen. It does not apply if you owe just the chaymish. It does not apply if you owe less than shavar pruta of the karen. The Gemara is going to show how these cases could occur. So the Gemara says, let's say you paid off the karen, but you didn't pay the chaymish. Or, let's say the victim was Michael the karen, but he wasn't Michael the chaymish. So then you only owe the chaymish. You don't have to go to such lengths to return it. If he was Michael the entire thing, the karen and the chaymish, except for he left off Less than Shavar Pruta of the Karen. Again, that's less than Shavar Pruta now, so you don't have to go so far. Now, what if he gave him the Chemish, but he didn't give him the Karen, so he still owes the Karen? Or he was Michael the Chemish, and he wasn't Michael the Karen, so he still owes the Karen. Or he's Michael both, except for more than a Shavar Pruta of the, uh, or at least a Shavar Pruta of the Karen. So then he does have to follow him and return it as long as it takes. Now, this you can actually have the fifth of the fifth, and that number will get smaller and smaller until you get to a shavar proof that the same levels will apply. How's that? So if you stole $100, he swore that he doesn't owe it, and then he admitted that he owes it, so now he has to pay 125 So the chlemish is 25 Then he pays the 100 and then he swears that he already paid the 25 the chlemish, but he really didn't. Later he admitted that he lied. So now he owes a chlemish of that 25 which is about a little less than $6. So now he owes another $6, um, six, whatever it is, that he has to return. And if he does the same thing again, he pays the 25 and now he owes another 6 and he swears, then he has to pay another 
a chaymish of that six, which would be a dollar and a half. And this number keeps going down and down and down. At the point that it becomes less than a shavar pruta, he no longer has this halacha, that there is no denial of a shavar pruta, you wouldn't have to uh, add chaymish, you wouldn't have to swear, you wouldn't have to do anything with it. Now, all this applies, says not only, says the Mishnah, not only to returning a stolen object, but also to returning a pikadon, an object which is left with you for safekeeping, or to borrow one of the four shimerim, um, you have to return it in the same manner, in the same halachos of traveling to Madai and returning the extras. And the Gemara, the Mishnah quotes the Pasuk, it says, All these things, you have a Pikadon, or you stole it, or however else you ripped the guy off, denied it, and swore, and then on about all of those things, it says um, <clears throat> that you have to add chaymish and you have to return it hashava malia, and uh, there's also a carbon asham as well. The Mishnah says. We now begin the Gemara. The Gemara notes that this Mishnah only said the if he swore falsely. That you only have to chase the guy to Madai to return it if he swore that he didn't, and then he admitted. So Mara asked that there's Mokhek between Rabbi Tarfan and Rabbi Akiva about a similar case, how to what lengths you have to go to make sure that you returned it. But neither of them are Mokhek between swearing or not swearing, and therefore this mission, which is Mokhek, doesn't fit with either of them. So Mara brings a Brisa, Mokhek is Rabbi Tarfan and Rabbi Akiva, is in a situation where somebody stole something from someone, and he doesn't know which of five people it is. There's five people who all claim he stole it from me, and he doesn't know. Who it is. So what's he supposed to do? He only stole from one, but doesn't know who. So Rabbi Tarfin says, put it down in the middle between all of them, and then leave it up to them to figure out. And then he returned it. Rabbi Kiva says, no, he hasn't gotten himself out of the Aveir until he makes sure that he returned it to the rightful owner, and therefore he has to return it to all five of them, the full amount. Yeah, he pays five times more than he stole, but it's his problem. He has to guarantee that he returned it correctly. And again, neither of them are like between uh, if he swore or not. So therefore, according to Rabbi Tarfin, you don't have to worry about returning it 100%, even if you swore. Um, and according to Rabbi Akiva, you have to w- worry about returning it and make sure that you it did return it, even if you didn't swear. So, who is this Mishnah fit with? So, the Mara says, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfin are actually discussing a situation in which the, he swore. And therefore, this Mokhagis, this Shita here, would be like Rabbi Akiva, that he swore, and therefore he has to do Hashav Amalia. But Rabbi Tarfin, if he swore, even if he swore, he does not have to do a Hashav Amalia. However, Rabbi Kiva would agree that if he hadn't sworn, he wouldn't have to do a Hashav Amalia. Now, what's the source of the Mokhagis? Mark quotes a Pasuk, it says, L'asher hulo yitnenu, v'yayim ashmasoi. Because he swore in his an Asham, he has to make sure La Sher Hulai has to give it correctly back to the one who it was stolen from. And Rabbi Tarfin, he says that the Rabbanan made a Takana and they wanted to make it easier for him to return, even in case we swore falsely. There's a special Takana to make it easier for people to return. Quotes from Baisa Tadik, Senator Belezabar Tzadik says that they made a Takana Gidayla, that if somebody has uh, too many expenses to return something, to return the Karen, he can give it to the Vaisdin and bring his carbon asham, and then he is atoned for, and I guess it's up to the basin to figure out how to return it. The Rabbi Kiva says, no, the Takan is only made in a case where he stole, where he's returning the uh, money to its rightful master, and it's just a question of how is he going to get it there. But here, where he's still from one of the five, he doesn't know if he's returning anything to the right person. He's just going to leave it, he doesn't know if anybody's going to get anything. And therefore, the Takana does not apply in a situation like that. Now, the Gemara asks, this can't be right. This can't be what the case was. It can't be that there was a Shavuot. The Gemara has two kashas in that. First kasha, that's where Huna Bar Rav Yehuda, name of Shimon ben Elazar, that Rav Shimon ben Elazar says that he points out that the Machlegs of Betarfa and Rav is only in a case where it was stolen, that the person stole it and he doesn't know which of the five he stole it from. Not where he borrowed it or took it as a Bikadon, where he took it in some other mutter way and now he doesn't know who to return it to. In that case, there will be no machlekes. Rabbi Kiva would not say you have to put it down. Rabbi Kiva would not say you have to make sure to return it because he didn't do anything wrong. He took it beheter. Says the Gemara, if he swore, that means that he swore falsely. That means that the guy came to collect it from him and he swore he didn't have it. At that moment, it turns into being stolen. So what's the difference then if he 
took it and then swore falsely, or if he stole it and then swore it falsely. Either way, once he's swearing falsely, some might say, yes, sir, he has it as theft. And therefore, there shouldn't be a difference between those two. You shouldn't be able to be mechalic between whether he took it or he stole it. And therefore, we can't be talking about where it was sworn falsely, where it was sworn at all. That's Gemara's first kasha. Gemara's second kasha is asked by Rava. From an incident that happened, there was a chassid echad, one tzaddik, who took something from one of two people, took it beheter as a pikadin, didn't know which one, and he wanted to return it. So he went to Rabbi Taf and asked him what to do, and he said, put it between them and leave. He went to Rabbi Kiv and said, what should I do? He said, you have no takana until you pay it back fully to each one. Meaning they each took the position that we have in this brisa. Says the Gemara, if it was a chassid, it was a tzaddik, it couldn't be that he swore falsely. A chassid doesn't swear it falsely. Says him, or maybe you'll tell me, at that time he was not a chassid. He swore falsely, then afterwards became a chassid. And that's why we call him a chassid. So he says, that couldn't be either, because we know who a chassid is. Any time Chazal brings a story with a chassid, echad, it's either Behuda ben Bava or Behuda bar Eloi. And they were tzaddikim from the beginning. There was no point at which they would have sworn falsely. And therefore it can't be that Rabbi Tarf and Rabbi Kiva only say their halacha in a case where they swore falsely. The Gemara therefore changes path and says, no, really the Mahalik is between Rabbi Tarf and Rabbi Kiva is in a case where they did not swear. And Rabbi Kiva, who says even in a case where they did not swear, you have to return it to each one, is certainly in a case where they swore, he would say you have to return it to each one. Rabbi Tarf, however, is Mahalik. Rabbi Tarf says in a case where they did not swear, you just put it down and leave. However, he would agree in a case where you swore, you have to give it to each one. And therefore, the author of our Mishnah, that is Mahalik, between swearing and not swearing, is Rabbi Tarfin. Now, what's the reason why he's more machma when you swear? That's because it says, La'asher hulay, then it'll be yim ashmasay, when he did an asham, when you swore falsely, you have to make sure that it's La'asher hulay, you give it back properly. Yomarno asks, Stam, the shita of Rabbi Tarfin, that's machalik, that's how we want to learn in the Mishnah, but the Mishnah itself and this shita doesn't make sense. Because the Pasuk that's teaching me this halacha, about having to to make sure do Ashava Ma'aya says it in the case where somebody denied it and then he admitted. It doesn't say anything about swearing. So any situation where there was originally a denial and then a confession, he should have to return it. And the reason is the reason you have to do Ashava Ma'aya there, the Gemara says, is because since he's confessing, he wants to be Yetzi De Shemayim. He originally denied it, so it's a theft. And now he wants to return it, so he has to do it properly. And it's not because of the basin's mechayvim. The basin can't be mechayvim. But he wants to get out of an einish, and he's not out of the einish until they make sure to do a full returning. So then it's even without swearing. So it doesn't make a difference if he swore. The Gemara therefore brings a Rebbe who changes Pshat altogether. Rebbe says the mechaykas between Rebbe Tarfin and Rebbe Kiva has nothing to do with our Mishnah. The mechaykas between Rebbe Tarfin and Rebbe Kiva, it makes no difference if he swore or if he did not swear, since he doesn't know who he's returning it to. You're not yet to returning it until you give it back properly, each one according to the way he understands it. Our case here, he knows who he stole it from. And he's, therefore, as soon as he admits it, it's like the, it's, it's a pikadin in his hand. It's like the owner said, you hold on to it until you get a chance to give it to me. And therefore, he's allowed to hold on to it. And he doesn't have to chase him down. Only if he swore falsely, now you have a problem, because now he needs a kapara for that avera of swearing. So the reason why he has to go chase him down is to get that kapara. But as far as the owner, there you don't have a problem, you don't have to try to figure out who the owner is, because we know who the owner is, and he can return it whenever he returns it.